Hello, this is David Hahn of Aspect Art. Today we're going to be talking with Jeroen Giltheit at Boymans von Beringen in Rotterdam. Now that's a difficult thing for an English-speaking person to say, so we'll just say we're at Boymans for the Dutch Classicism. Now Dutch Classicism was born in Harlem. We're standing in front of one of the paintings by the first purveyor of Dutch Classicism, Holtius. Now, this is an altogether new look at what was happening in the 17th century. A lot of it hasn't even been seen, many of these painters completely forgotten. So join me now for Dutch Classicism in Rotterdam. Jorn, perhaps you could tell me, uh, while we stand in front of one of these beautiful classical paintings, what exactly is Dutch Classicism? Well, it's a style we know from architecture, mainly classical architecture is well known from that 17th century, but it's always also um, a style in Dutch painting, and we present this for the first time. We try to present it because it's a, it's, it's a difficult subject. But when you uh, walk through the exhibition, you, you'll see what we mean. The, those artists um, had a, a great interest in, in, in classical uh, antiquity, of course, but they, they developed a certain style um, which was used for official buildings especially, a very colorful style inspired on yeah, on 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 uh, classical antiquity with with uh, with very uh, classical compositions with uh, with uh, people who seem to come from the past who who look very much like Roman sculptures and so far it was not known that I mean we know that uh, for example from from French 17th century painting that there is a classical style that's well known all over the world but th that you have these features also in Dutch 17th century art uh, of, of which we know landscapes portraits uh, etc uh, was not known so far so it's a kind of investigating uh, exhibition well, as I look around, I, I, I think of Dutch 17th century. We oftentimes think of these black-robed people with stiff collars, but it, what I see are a lot of very sensual, almost erotic paintings. Uh, was this a, a kind of the other style of Dutch 17th century? Yes, well, it's interesting. We opened this exhibition at the same time as the self-portraits of Rembrandt in the Maritz House in The Hague, and we called our exhibition The Other Face of the 17th Century. It's, um, it's a kind of opposite of Rembrandt, because it's, it's very colorful, uh, very erotic, you can easily say. Um, and um, it... Um, where well, you see with Rembrandt these, these very strong contrasts of, of, of dark and light, the people coming out of the dark more or less. Uh, here you, do, you hardly see any shadow at all. It's just a, a very a stiff, almost uh, building up of the composition with, with marbles and, and with... But also very uh, joyful. They're very, very happy paintings, I think. And... Um, it's amazing that we could uh, borrow three paintings of the palace of Huis ten Bosch near The Hague. It was um, um, uh, a design of Jacob van Kampen who asked those painters who he thought could, could, could have a, a classical style and uh, made they, these painters made these huge paintings for, for the Oranje Zaal, Huis ten Bosch. And when you walk around there it's almost one style. And um, that's uh, yeah, uh, a kind of painting which is hardly no, those people are almost forgotten nowadays. Like Cesar van Everdingen, we are standing in a room full of his paintings. He's presented, in fact, for the first time in history, and he was apparently so famous in 17th century that he was asked to help with the decoration. But nowadays forgotten. And that's for many of the painters we present here. Salomon de Bray, Pieter de Greber, uh, Jan de Bray. Uh, hardly known painters, but we, who were very famous in their time. Classical styles oftentimes uh, idealize the human form. I notice as I look at some of these paintings that uh, you can still see the, the Dutch girl in some of these models. Uh, could you talk about the style itself, the Dutch 
classicism and how it differs from uh, those that uh, might have been in Italy or, uh, well, for that matter, Belgium? Well, I think they, they, they really tried to uh, create a kind of international style. I think they were well aware of what was happening in, in France and uh, uh, everybody knows Poussin as the great classical painter. And maybe they try to do something like that to, to, to be international. But <clears throat> yeah, the, the, the moving aspect is I think they, they, they still are so Dutch. And that was also <clears throat> an, um, something they said to Rembrandt. Uh, you, you, they, they painted, he painted a nude, but you still could see that it was his, his, his girlfriend, so to say. It, it, it kept as realistic as possible. And they, the painters here try to be more yeah more uh, more idealistic but they they didn't really succeed in in creating a kind of french classicistic style so but but i think that's that's all that's the moving part of the exhibition now many of these uh, painted it in a huge scale in your show were they also painting the small still lives for the burgers to keep the the guilders coming in no, they, uh, we ha well, they, uh, they painted portraits, for example. They had to live from portraits, of course. And, uh, but, uh, but many, uh, I don't know any still life or, or landscape or whatever of, of these artists. They were, uh, as I said, from time to time also portrait painters, like Jan de Bray, who lived probably from his portraits. And, and we don't know by whom these paintings were uh, asked for. We don't know the, uh, for example, by Jan de Bray, there are some huge paintings and they must have been commissioned because, uh, and they were very well known because we have a magnificent painting here in the exhibition by Jan de Bray representing Anthony and Cleopatra, uh, very uh, Roman history, and uh, uh, the, the, port, uh, the people who were the models for Anthony and Cleopatra were his own father and mother, which is then very Dutch again, I think. But there's an earlier version uh, in uh, the English royal collection, and that was all, it's now in Hampton Court, and that was already collected in the 17th century by the English king. So they must have had a certain reputation, I think. Otherwise, the king wouldn't have bought this painting. When I think about uh, the Renaissance effect on painting, it, it was tremendous. But by this period, of course, the Renaissance was over and the only real light was Caravaggio. Did he have any effect on these painters? Well, I don't, th I don't really think so. Uh, I don't know how far Caravaggio was known in Holland at that time. Maybe, maybe they have heard of him, but, well, he played some role, of course, for Rembrandt, of course, and but it was not the uh, the example for uh, for these painters, I think, because well, we know Caravaggio with his very strong, dark and light contrasts, and uh, that was where he was known for. But I think they they choose other. They were probably impressed by Raphael, for example. I, th I think when you see some paintings of say of an Everding, and you almost you can compare them with Raphael. With a very, with no shadows, very bright colors, and also the mysterious subjects. It has a kind of mystery, I think, often. Speaking of mystery, uh, what were these painters really trying to convey to the uh, to their patrons? Uh, was there a kind of like there was in the Renaissance, a sort of Venus undercurrent, or a, a kind of a, a pagan, if you will? Uh, understanding of mythology. Was there any of that kind of uh, idealism going on in Holland at that time? Maybe the uh, revels? Yeah. yeah, certainly. There were uh, Salomon de Bray, for example. I mentioned him as, an, as a painter, but he was also a poet, and he could uh, read Latin, for example, and he could, I think, even read Greek. And he published uh, a small book with poems sometime. And he was also an architect, uh, kind of in, in, a, in a Roman classical style. So I think they, they all studied uh, Roman literature. They knew of it. Uh, they knew uh, uh, Roman uh, uh, architecture, for example. So 
and it was a kind they had a kind of intellectual groups and uh, coming together and studying literature and music uh, also um, Jacob van Kampen for example had a, a wonderful castle uh, in the, the middle of Holland and he was a good friend with Paulus Bohr Paulus Bohr is also one of the painters in our exhibition and they uh, they had a lot of contact and they were probably discussing uh, the themes and, and what you could paint and new uh, subjects from, from uh, Roman history or so also Paulus Bohr is a kind of riddle we have, we have three paintings by him in the exhibition and they have the most obscure title subjects from from uh, Roman literature, Sidippe with the apple of Acontius. Nobody knows the subject, but he he painted it, and so there must have been a kind of intellectual group interested in these kind of paintings. And basically speaking, who were the patrons of these uh, sumptuous uh, classicism? Yeah. yeah, that's still a riddle. Uh, so we don't know uh, in most cases, but. We only know that, uh, for example, for town halls, uh, for, um, for important official buildings, uh, those people, these people were asked to make the decorations. So, but we don't know, for example, who ordered these paintings we, are, we know of uh, Caesar van Everdingen. But Jan de Bruy, for example, was asked for the Haarlem town hall to make a painting above the chimney. Uh, Abraham van den Tempel delivered three huge paintings. Uh, well, you've seen the paintings from Huis ten Bos, which was, was also a commission. But, um, yeah, I think there still has to be done some research to find out more. Um, one painting by Peter de Greber is coming from a church in Germany. So we think the church has ordered this painting for that church. But there's still, there's, there's still some research to be done, I think. Well, maybe you could tell me, how long is this show going to be on and when can the people come and see it? Well, it's open now. We opened, of course, at the same time as the famous uh, exhibition of the self-portraits of Remnant because we hope uh, many visitors from abroad do both exhibitions. Uh, and it will also end on the 9th of January and afterwards it will travel to the museum in Frankfurt, the Städelsches Kunstinstitut, and so the German visitors can see it there as well.